President Macron, is he trying to sell you a French bank? What's happening here? Uh, no, no, he's not trying to sell us a French bank. What he's trying to sell us all on is doing business in France, choose France. And, you know, we have moved from 100 people here to about 750 people under Vanessa Holt's leadership for our European uh, broker-dealer trading operations. And, and they've been great and accommodative. And, and the rules and stuff, it's, it's been a great experience for us. What have they changed? What have they done to attract that investment from you? Well, we needed a talent because we were locating a lot of jobs here. Some people moved, some people didn't. Um, so they have a lot of talent. They have a lot of great people. They know the trading business because of the large French banks and the regulatory framework. And so they've made it accommodative to bring it over. And then they've made some work rule changes specific to our employees in the financial services business and made it easier. And they, they're always ready. Now they're trying to say, can you move a back office and other things here? So they're pitching a different style of economic development. But they've done a good job in changing France's reputation around the business community. There's few hundred CEOs out there, all of whom have expanded their operations in France. The reputation used to be pretty terrible. In fact, you know what the perception was? Why would you hire anyone in France when you can do that in London? Was it Brexit that changed that in the last 10 years? Is it something else? Has France actually got better as opposed to the UK getting worse? Well, I think what they did is they made it they're accommodative. They had the talent. They had the capability. Um, schools could expand and take people. They're, they're, those are real things. But what they really did is they said, we need to attra be attractive. So they have lower tax rates. They've worked on some of the work rules. Those are longer-term strategies that will help the country. They're trying to close the gap, clearly, with the United States. Let's talk about the United States as well. I got a note from the Bank of America Institute, from Liz, the great work they do over there, and I was looking at the average balance for a customer compared to the average back in 2019 and for lower income. The numbers that you've got show it up close to 60%. What on earth is going on? How are the balances that much higher now versus, say, five years ago? Well, the thing is that the account that was here in 19 uh, lived through all the stimulus benefits and all the deposits went in, has also been ostensibly working since 19, therefore they've gotten the wage increases. And while inflation is tough on people, especially in the lower uh, median income and down in terms of increases, the wages have been growing. Uh, they just grew first, honestly, and then the prices grew after, so people remember the price growth, don't remember the wage growth so much. But I, I think, you know, it shows the resilience of the American consumer. And if you look at the spending uh, through the month so far in May, they're spending about 3 or 4% more than they did last May in the first part of May. April was similar. It's slower. It's more consistent with a lower growth, lower inflation economy. But it's still positive. And positive means people are spending more. That means our economy is growing. And, you know, and the rate structure may be higher, and we can talk about that. But the reality is it's in decent shape. There's a thousand things that can go wrong tomorrow. But right now, everything's in pretty good shape. Are we living pretty well, then, with interest rates north of 5%? We're living pretty well with them, and people are getting used to it. But the reality is, at some point, the Fed has to bring the front end rate to get to a normalized curve, because a, an inverted curve forever doesn't sort of economically compute. But I think our team thinks that the terminal rate, the end rate, that they'll get to will be more in the 3.5% range, as opposed to 50 basis point range or 1% range. And we haven't really had that since before the financial crisis. There was a moment in 16, 17, 18 where they raised rates, and they already started bringing them down to 19. So, Frankly, in our team, I say, if you're under 40, you've never seen this kind of rate environment. And this is normal. And so 3% front end, 35 4.5% 4 tenure, and people will get used to it because America did a lot of economic activity prior to 2007 for the 200-plus years of existence. So people have been used to it. It's just we're in a very unusual time, and so the adjustments are taking place, and it's running through the economy. We're hearing from some companies that maybe there are some cracks. We heard from Starbucks, McDonald's, offering a similar view on the U.S. consumer. You've got some 69 million customers. What do you see? Do you see those cracks at all starting to emerge this year? So if you think about it, what, where would the cracks emerge? You talked about the average account balances. They're still, especially for households 75, 100,000 and below, the, the, the account balances are higher than the pandemic by a lot. If you think about the, the spending, the spending settled into a more normal, where it was in 16, 17, 18, the Fed was raising rates, inflation, they're pushing, you know, inflation was higher, they're pushing it down or holding it steady. You know, so that's, that's normal. And then on the credit side, we're just normalizing to where we were in 19. So in 2019, was a 50-year low in credit costs in our company. And basically, last quarter, we were a little bit higher than that. And so we're normalizing. So it's increasing off a of base. And people say, oh, your charge-offs are going up. But they're getting back to where they were in 19. And frankly, people thought that was very good credit. And it factually was. And so the question is where they go next. The good news is we're starting to see delinquencies flatten back out, i.e. they're not growing anymore. They normalize, and then they, they're staying. That's good news on the consumer side. So it's all OK. It's just higher rates are tough on people on the mortgage market. We, you know, Mortgage originations are way down. Higher rates are tough on uh, 
corporations are using their lines a little bit less because, you know, small, medium-sized companies, because yeah. it costs more. And if it costs more, you're going to be more judicious about it. So th that kind of adjustment, what the Fed is doing with rate structure, is having the impact they want. On the other hand, the economy is kind of there, and now we've got to be careful we don't overshoot the other way. And so right now we have a, a no landing, honestly, a 2% growth rate because you can't say it's a soft landing. But that's been pushed out and pushed out to when it occurs, and we've got to be careful that we don't overshoot because you see the consumer confidence numbers tipping down a little bit. That's what you've got to be careful of. The consumer leaves the game, it's hard to get them restarted. So when I look at your consumer and whenever we report on your numbers, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, we look at the average FICO score of some of the lending that happens, and it's really, really high, like close to 800 for vehicle lending. Can you tell me whether your experience is a decent snapshot of America or whether you're just catering to a much higher quality consumer? On the lend si lending side, we're pr you know, prime, super prime and auto, for example. Yeah. So there's a broader base of consumers out there, 80-20 you know, rule, prime versus subprime, and we don't play in the pr subprime at all. So, and that's because of history and how we got here. On a deposit side, completely different. We open accounts for anybody that really wants an account. And then we are a great starter place for people to open their first bank account and then grow with us. And we opened a million of them, uh, basically, over the last 12 months, a million net new accounts. They started 3,000. They grow to 7,000. So that's pretty representative of America. And we're 90% plus uh, the core household account, meaning it's used for all the day-to-day -day flows. So we got pretty good data there. On the lending side, we probably tilt just a little higher, but it's still strong. And but 80% of America is prime space, so it's not like it's. It, so the, the difficulties you're hearing about, I can't really reflect on, but they're they tend to be in the in the subprime space. That's the consumer. Let's talk about businesses. We're seeing a ton of debt issuance, supplies through the roof for Q1. What do you think that is? We've been trying to work out whether that's pull forward from the back end of this year or catch up from the back end of last year. Which one is it? Well, I think if you if you did a lot of financing, and it's coming up in the next couple of years. Your hope would be rates would fall and you get a lot more nominal rate because you may have done it, you know, in 2020 or something when there's a massive amount of issuance. The problem is it's not clear that's going to happen. So now people are saying, I don't want to run to the wall and then find out the market closes because some uh, external event or something. So people are just financing it forward. There probably was some pull through of, of the year when people said all oh, rates may, you know, not go down. Why don't we just get it done and get it over with, you know. The market's business is kind of fascinating. The first half of the year is always much more active than the second half of the year. And you keep saying there's four quarters. Why wouldn't it space out? It's just natural human behavior. People like to get things done. Yeah. Um, but I think it's been pretty strong, and we feel pretty good about it. We had a good investment banking fee first quarter, which really reflects financing activity, equity, and debt. But I, I, I'm not sure there's any right answer there. But the reality is that it was very high, so the assumption would be go lower. But on the other hand, there's people have to look forward and say, am I going to wait to 2026 to refinance that debt or frankly they're investing you know there's lots of capital improvements going on people want to turn that out there's lots of m and is starting to kick up a little bit and people want to pay for those deals so there's there's stuff going on too that requires them to raise incremental new money can we touch on m a we talked about this a few months ago when we visited you and you talked about the reality for some companies that they can't make deals right now because they don't know if those deals will close do you sense that there is some momentum in the business now going into november or is there a sense that people are just going to wait to see how this washes out the, the activity going on in the business is very high a lot of conversations a lot of deals being signed up there's still the concern still applies of whether deals which would appear to any other in the past, so to speak, have gone through without challenge, without delay. To stay with a deal for a year plus takes a lot of intestinal fortitude. It, a lot of things can happen to your company, can happen to the other company. You know, people can lose enthusiasm for the deal. All things can go on. And so people have to sit there and say, can I do that? Large companies can hang on longer because they just have more resiliency, especially if they're buying a smaller company. But a company that's buying a company might be 30 to 40 percent of the size. They have to be very careful and they're cautious. They want to do it. The question is, can they get it done? And that's one of the things we say to policymakers is clarify the rules and let people get through. Because an MA transaction, people think, well, it's just about getting bigger. Remember, yeah. on a sell, uh, the sell side, that's obvious. The payment goes out to the shareholders and the employees a lot. That's good for them. But on the buy side, what does it mean? That company is making an acquisition, getting bigger, going to dominate the world. We're going to go over and we're going to become the best at X, Y, or Z. Without being able to make acquisitions, they can't get that strategic growth. So it's a especially when you're talking America only, those American companies are looking to be the best companies in the world, and M&A is one of the ways they do it. If you stop them, you're stopping America's prosperity and growth. And I think, frankly, the theme here in France is we need business, we need labor, we need government, we need it all work together, we need green, we need oil and gas, yep. we need nuclear, we need it all work together. That idea of trying to figure out how it all works together, because at the end of the day, 
the numbers of employees for our companies and us growing on a worldwide stage is critical to the health of America. Do you not get that message from Washington right now? You get it. It's mixed. It's mixed. And I think that's been the debate is how, how do you – America is – has a chance to win like it's never had to win because of the resilience of our economy. So when you look at 2007 to now, you look at the size of the European economy, U.S. economy back then, roughly the same size. Now America's 50 to 60 percent bigger. That's the resiliency of the American economy. So we have to have capitalism done right. And I think policies that promote that are what's going to drive America to stay great and be great. We can solve any problem. We can get through everything if we're growing. And one of the ways we grow is by letting M&A happen, by letting our companies do it fairly with the consumer, fairly with other companies, but do it the right way. You sound like a policymaker. Uh, I, I, this, look, I've been at this a long time now, and I've seen the ups and downs. Uh, you know, I think it's really interesting. When you think about countries, companies around the world, they want to invest in the United States, talent, work rules, uh, big market, you know, huge market. And I think there's real opportunity for American companies if we get this right. Every time we talk, the interview ends in the same place. Treasury Secretary, thoughts on Washington? I, I have the greatest job in the world, and I've got a lot of work to do for Bank of America, so I'll let somebody else have that honor.